Welcome to a Thursday edition of the First Things First podcast. I'm your host, Jenna Wolf. Catch us Monday through Friday, 6.30 a.m. Eastern on FS1. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts. Tell us what you think and leave us a review. Time now to bring in Nick and the Hall of Famer, Chris Carter. A lot of politics mixing with sports this Mm -hmm. week, and that's where we start this morning. Demonstrations surrounding the national anthem have dominated headlines for the past week. President Trump has not been shy about his opinion. Trump commented again Wednesday saying the NFL has to change or their business will, quote, go to hell. CC, I will start with you. What is your reaction to the president's latest comments about the NFL, the National Football League, as it is? Well, I think this is our 98th year of being in business, and business couldn't be better. Now, there are some, as you would say, distractions. There are some other things on the outside, but... Noise, as you would say. That, that, and that's all it is. The NFL business right now is as strong as it's ever been. Um, we have labor peace. We have long-term agreements with multiple television partners. Um, we're getting into the online business as far as how we're going to package. Last year, they did a deal with um, Twitter, Twitter. Amazon. So the revenue streams continue to grow internationally. uh, Ultimately, there will be a team um, abroad in Europe, probably in London. Um, If you look at the business evaluations of the teams, Nick, all of them are astronomical. Almost every team in the NFL, I think, now is worth a billion dollars. Now, I've met with the NFL with some minority partners about buying shares of NFL owners um, of teams. Teams eight years ago, three hundred million. Ten years ago, one hundred and fifty million. Now, you can't even buy a minority share. You know, five hundred million won't even get you the minority share of an NFL of a, a NFL team. So, no, I don't think the business is going to hell. Uh, the product on the field is still good. It's still the most popular sport in America. And when you have labor peace and you have television agreements long term, those are the ingredients for success. And the NFL will continue to grow. Nick, I, I now finally kind of understand when people on Twitter or otherwise tell sportscasters to stick to sports because I'm just sitting here begging the president to stay out of sports. Like we are, we are, can we please, I hope this can pass without us drawing ideological lines on football. Like of all things, like let's not have football become a red blue issue, please. And as far as the substance of his comments, I actually think because the 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 point the thing that people will point at is ratings. Ratings were down last year, right? And yep. the ratings this year they are down slightly compared to last year. And if they were down last year, then, okay. So this is where facts do matter. Last year, the ratings for almost everything were down except for one one area: politics. news and politics. Yes. And that is where President Trump, I guess, does get a lot of credit. Like, people either love him or for because they love him or hate him. They are, at least during the election cycle particularly, they were enchanted by what was going on. And the other thing that is happening is ratings for almost every network, and I don't say this to be congratulatory, almost except for ours because we're so new. FS1 still relatively a young network. Ratings for almost every network are going down because people my age and younger than me are streaming through the Internet. Yes. They are cord cutting. And so you can tell a story. Look, yes. here's the NFL ratings four years ago. Here it is now. I'm blaming Colin Kaepernick. Right. But there's, but there's a huge portion of society, like you mentioned, right. how they're getting their sports is totally different. Now. Correct. It, but so the NFL was due for a correction. The NFL for, as you were talking about, Team values were just skyrocketing. Ratings were skyrocketing. We were acting as if we didn't live in a sports culture where over the course of the last 150 years, it's always been cyclical. Horse racing is the most popular in the world. Mm -hmm. Then boxing. Then baseball. Then football. Then the NBA. Then football again. Like, that's, that's what it's been. So 
So, of course, the NFL, it wasn't going to be an un, a, a breakaway train that always went up. There was going to be something of a correction. But the idea that football teams are, or the football business is in trouble, if that were the case, I, right now, how many football teams are for sale? Just curious. None. 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 Like, if there were, it, it'd be one thing if it's like, man, seven football teams for sale right now, no buyers. Right. Th- right. That's not the reality that we're living in. Yeah, I, I think also the re if I was part of that conversation um, with the president, my re to him would be, sir, there's a potential for you to own an NFL team. Would you like to? If it was made available to you. Because I think part of the president's problem with the NFL is not only the national anthem, but he hadn't been included. He got he, shut out. He would like to be included in this group, but he will never be included to be an NFL owner, regardless of how much money he has or how much money he can prove he has. So that's how good the business is. If the question was, was put to him, hey, if it was offered you to buy a team, would you buy it? Because it's a great business. I don't think he could answer that question, honestly. And, and you mentioned the substance of, of the president's comments. The substance of his comments didn't have much substance to it. Because the president is obviously referring to the NFL going to hell because of the first two minutes yeah. before the game even starts. I don't know how much of games he watched on Sunday. I don't know how much he cares about rivalries. I don't know how much he cares about how well teams are playing or who's watching or what. Yes, ratings are down. They're down across the board for something that has nothing to do with whether players are kneeling or not. They just happen not to be. We're watching everything here. We're getting, mm-hmm. we're getting scores and highlights elsewhere. But he's only referring to those two minutes before the game. And my question is, where do we go from here? What does that look like this week? Does this, is this a conversation that is going to continue throughout the entire season, or does this die out when we get a little quieter during the conversation? What I think the rhetoric will be Monday, because I'm pretty certain we will have less guys taking the knee oh, no this week than last week. And will so that continue? What he'll probably declare some type of victory because there's less people on their knee, and what he has said is no one should be on their knee. And and the other thing, and this is where I just don't, I think this is a bad bet as far as are you going to be proven out correct. There were Throughout the entire season, there are going to be some players that kneel. I would guess about around half the teams are going to have at least one guy that kneels to some type of anthem demonstration, whether it be a fist in the air or something. Mm-hmm. And... People need sports too much to even if they're irked by. Some people are irked by, more than irked, that Colin's not in the league. Some people are irked by the fact, more than irked, about the league's domestic violence policy. Some people are bothered by the kneeling. But we need sports. Like this is, and and we are about to do a fun LeBron Wade conversation because I know you guys need sports first thing in the morning. But here's the thing that you learn as you get older. Man, life is hard. Like, no matter how great of a job you have, no matter how great of a marriage you have, life's hard. And you need those, an escape. Those bills are due every week, man. Like, you, you, you're you always worried about your kids. You're always trying to, like, improve your interpersonal relationships. You always have a family member that is either not doing well health-wise or not doing well financially. Life is hard. And it is it is nice to be able to, for a few hours a day, if you can, or a mm-hmm. few hours a week, as it may be for some people, or 45 minutes once every two weeks for some, to be able to be like, man, I am turning my brain off, and I'm gonna, and I'm just gonna root for my hometown team. I'm just gonna watch these amazing feats of athleticism. People need that. And regardless of what the president says, there's no way you can consume professional football. You can't go to another country. No one else plays it. We have the best players in the world. So the demand to see football played at its highest, yeah, Friday Night Lights, it's special. Oh, it's great. I love it. I used to be a high school coach. College, the bands, the pomp, the pageantry, around the smell of college football, the excitement. It's amazing. But there's nothing like pro football. And there's nothing like the NFL. So I don't see it going anywhere. 
98 years and strong, as I would call it. Hashtag going strong. There you go. There you go. Cece with a hashtag. It's come up with Spicy Friday and going strong. LeBron James sounds excited about the acquisition of his BFF, Dwayne Wade. That's best friend forever, Nick. Thanks. Wade officially signed. That's a reference from the 90s. Wade officially signed with the Cavs yesterday. The two have an extensive history, including two titles, a gold medal, 100 jokes, and over 9,000 minutes on the floor together. LeBron had an interesting way of describing Wade's addition to the team. Listen. I'm happy that we was able to keep him away from everybody else. And I mean, it's the guy. I mean, come on, man. It's like one of my best friends. So, you know, uh, it's like, uh, it's kind of like when you start school and, uh, you know, you walk into the classroom, not quite sure who your classmates is. And when you walk in there, one of your best friends is in there. You're like, oh, yeah, this is going to be fun. <laughs> it's going to be a good class. So, uh, it's the type of feeling I got. Nick, he's. He's genuinely happy. Genuinely He's excited. He's genuinely excited about Dwayne Wade on this team. You pick up on that. And and I, he genuinely believes that, that Dwayne Wade is going to help the Cavs get better. Right. It's not just about the friendship. I mean, these guys were friends before they played together. They were friends after they played together. Mm -hmm. The fact that LeBron has now cost D. Wade roughly $25 million in his career doesn't seem to have affected the friendship. But let's start with this from a basketball perspective. Can Dwayne Wade help the Cavs? So I watched, I think, every game the Cavs played last year. And what was very obvious to everyone was when LeBron left the court, they were awful. When he was on the court, they were awesome. When, when he was on the court, playoffs and regular season, they're outscoring teams by nine points. When he's off the court, they are being outscored by nine points. That's an 18-point swing. But it's a little more complex than that because people are going to say, okay, so what can Dwayne Wade do? Some of it was just poor strategy. LeBron leaves the court in the final 90 seconds of the first quarter. And the team, for some reason, is playing at a fast pace while he's off the court. As opposed to slowing it down, limit the amount of possessions the other team's going to have while our best player's on the bench. Dwayne Wade's not going to let him do that. The, the fact that they seem to panic at times in the finals against the Warriors early on when the Warriors hit him with that opening haymaker. Dwayne Wade's going to have more of a calming presence, certainly more of a calming presence than my guy J.R. J.R. is a guy that is such an emotional player. Mm -hmm. he, can, he can ride a wave in a good direction or a bad direction. Yeah, he's a very streaky player. Right. None of this is going to come as something new to Dwayne Wade. So if, you, if he can just be a deep breath for the team when LeBron's getting some minutes, that in and of itself makes them better. In sports, you want to try to be as comfortable as possible. That being in football, baseball, any of the major sports. Surroundings are critical. We see a lot of the one-and-done players drafted into the NBA after one year of college. One of the things that they do is their parents or someone significant in their family typically moves to that city so that they have some familiar faces as they get acclimated to this new life. When we were trying to develop this show, um, regardless of some of the rumors that it might have been offered to other people, <laughs> um, Nick, when we met, I've met your family, and you would say that I'm one of your best friends. Yes. So the ability for you to be on TV with someone who you know gives you a comfort level 100% that it's not going to equate to a number, but you're allowed to function because you don't have the anxiety because there's a familiar face. He and still I, has anxiety. Though. Sure, but I see, see, and on that, to further that analogy, mm -hmm. I do think it makes other people around that do not have the relationship you and I have more comfortable. And yes. I, think that's the, I think people see Wade and LeBron and it makes other – Isaiah's new, but it makes him more comfortable. Like, the, they, they, have that, they have that relationship. This relationship, in my opinion, wouldn't work if Dwayne Wade had even this much of an ego, right? He took a pay cut to come here. He knows his minutes. Several. 
Several, but yes. let's just mm -hmm. talk about this particular yes. one. Mm -hmm. A big pay cut. Yes. And he knows it. He His limits, his minutes are going to be limited, and he knows that. And you already said that he acknowledges that he's probably going to be a deep breath for this team to come in and keep mm -hmm. everything pretty level-headed while either LeBron sits or when the team needs someone to come in and say, guys, we're, let's just manage, as opposed to trying to do anything big, let's just manage. That's super important. That's more important than just we're signing LeBron's best friend. That could be the difference. Uh, and this team. and uh, we also saw last year when LeBron rested, guys took it upon themselves. This is my moment to show the world. If it's Darren Williams, I still got it. Yes. If it's Kyrie Irving, yeah. it's that I can run things on my own. Without right. LeBron. And they failed. Yeah. They, 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 in those moments, the, 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 the data shows they failed failed when LeBron was on the bench. And I'm not trying to make it sound as if Wade's only going to play when LeBron's on the bench. But I think per he will particularly play in those spots. And, like, just think back to the 2015 finals. The finals when Kyrie was injured, Kevin Love was injured. How did – because people are like, ah, Wade is not the all-NBA guy he once was. Fine. Yes. But what if Wade was getting Matthew Della Vadova's minutes? What if – because th that's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about Dwayne Wade replacing an all-NBA shooting guard. It's Dwayne Wade bumps JR down the depth chart, which means Shumpert's bumped down the depth chart, mm -hmm. which means Darren Williams, who isn't on the team anymore, is off the depth chart. And all of a sudden, you're not playing four minutes where a guy who shouldn't be on the court. Like, that, it, it's the butterfly effect of the whole thing as far as adding productive minutes throughout the 48 minutes of the game. And let's not forget what LeBron said. LeBron said, also, I mean, he's my best friend, but I don't want to play against him. Like, Dwayne Wade makes, let's take all four teams in the West. Let's just create a hypothetical. OKC, he would help them. Golden State, he would help them. San Antonio, he would help them. Houston, he would help them. Good players help any team. So that's what this is about. He's a good player. He's got championship DNA. So adding that to what they're already doing, it's like adding a familiar face that you're going to have a bunch of storms, and LeBron is comfortable that D. Wade can help him battle those storms because we know in the NFL it's, it's rocky. I mean, in the NBA, it, it's very, very rocky. But LeBron and D. Wade have been through the toughest times of LeBron's career Together. Yeah. Right. And after what LeBron just went through with this whole ridiculously melodramatic Kyrie stuff. The kid. It's nice for LeBron to play with someone he likes, he respects. An adult. He knows isn't going to undercut him in any way. He knows is his actual friend. There's a level of confidence there and there's a level of trust there. And we know that come late January, early February, every year, LeBron gets a little in his feelings goes a little passive-aggressive, yes. and can rough, rub some teammates the wrong way. Long season, year 15, seven straight NBA Finals for LeBron. If there's anyone that can quell that storm a bit, D-Wade being like, hey, because it's hard to be able to talk to LeBron on an even playing field. Yes. Even the coaches can't do that. D-Wade can. Now I'm going to go real basketball nerdy just for a moment because I already know the analytics folks watching are saying, but what about the three-point shooting? We know LeBron is at his best with floor spacers. D-Wade has never been known as a three-point shooter. That is true. However, D-Wade is coming off the best year of his career as a three-point shooter. Going into last season, his whole career, the 13 years leading into last season, 28% on one-and-a-half threes a game. Last year, 31% on two-and-a-half threes a game. If he ups that just three percentage points to 34%, then you're a competent three-point shooter, and what we do know is guys tend to shoot better when LeBron James is the one passing them the ball because he gets it in the exact right spot, and LeBron James is the one commanding the double team and all the defense's attention. So Dwayne Wade, if he can just be a competent three-point shooter, that adds to his value there. The one thing as, as a veteran player is you get older, and it's nice to build a mentor players. It's nice the relationship LeBron had with, with Kyrie. It's, it's nice, Nick, that you and I have the relationship, but the reason why we hired Jenna, it wasn't just because she's a professional. Please tell me. It wasn't just because she looks great. I'm listening. It wasn't because she wears great clothes. Right here. It's because I need some adult conversation. Thank you. You know, Nick, you're a lot younger Pardon than us. Right, right. And LeBron and his wife, D. Wade and his wife, they're very close. 
all the time you spend on the NBA, it's a lot of lonely time, especially as an older guy with a bunch of young. Now, the Cavs, they do have an older roster, but you need adult conversation. We are back with Ray Lewis on First Things First. Cam Newton had a day to forget Sunday against the Saints. He threw three picks, no touchdowns, before getting pulled in the fourth quarter. Now he gets to face the New England Patriots, which sounds fun, said nobody ever. However, Bill Belichick was not talking, taking Cam lightly when asked where Cam ranks among mobile quarterbacks. He makes good decisions. He can run. He's strong. He's hard to tackle. Um, you know, he, he can... He can do a lot of different things, beach in a lot of different ways. Not saying the other guys aren't a problem, because they are. But yeah, he's he'd be public enemy number one. Ray, what do you want to see out of Cam Newton this week, besides more than last week? Yeah, I, I, just, just, just do what you do. Yeah. I, I think, you know, <clears throat> sometimes we try to put people in a box, right, and say, oh, he has to become, a, you know, before the season. He has to become a, a better passer, and he has to stay in the pocket more. Not really, not if you're winning. Like, do what you do. Like, go back to just having fun and just being Cam Newton. And because if you if you start to change in the middle like that to please what, who's ever talking, like, you take away the essence of the game. The essence of the game is just competition. It's just going out and doing what you do best. And I think what Cam, Nun, what Cam, Nun, what Cam Newton does best, he's always been that second or third option running the football. He's just always that, right, because he's that hybrid. He's bigger than most linebackers, yeah. always bigger than safeties and corners. So if he gets past the first tier of defense alignment, oh, man, it's a mismatch all day. So I think when you saw their success, you saw Cam in that mode. Yeah. Is he overthinking things? Is there too many people in his ear? Is that, is that what it looks like is happening yeah, right and, now? And it looks like he's not having fun. This game is fun. Do what you do. Yeah, and I, that's what I think. Ray, is, um, as a player, Yeah. How many times do you think that you kind of changed? Because you and I have talked about this. Mm -hmm. You talk about being young. You came into the league, you were weighing 200 and... <laughs> Come on, tell the truth. How much was you weighing? 15 pounds. 15, all right? You went about year four. In year four, I think you were defensive player of the year, right? Year four or five? Year five. Okay, year five. So by that time, your physical body had changed. Yeah. And... You stop. We talked about this. You stop relying on just athleticism and start getting into the film room, dissecting. So you went through several metamorphoses mm -hmm. during your career. Absolutely. All right. How important is that for Cam? Not to necessarily change his style, but you have to grow your game. Yeah, you have to master your craft. And one of the things that I took real like 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 attention to was what did that what did that look like? So when I took the defensive coordinators' books, I said I'm going to master those. There's nothing when I walk on the field I won't know. So when it comes to a weakness in a cover two, I know that's nine times out of ten on the middle linebacker. Right. But everybody that plays the New England Patriots play them ten to twelve yards off, and I'm gonna play you six or seven yards off because I know Brady's gonna come to his check down every time. It's those simple things that I think if you're Cam, you have to sit in the in the meeting room and and figure out yourself what does all this mean? Mm -hmm. Where where do I win at? Every time. And that's what I think. When you start to grow as a player, you start to take ownership in what you're really trying to do. And I think that's Cam. That's what he has to you, do. You mentioned Cam getting back to who he is. Yeah. It's not just that he's not running as much. 14 mm -hmm. carries no. on the year. Right. They have changed everything yeah. Yeah. about Cam was at his most successful, obviously, two years ago. MVP 15-1. and one. What was that offense? Yes, Cam mm -hmm. was running. The offense was also this. We know the offensive line isn't that great. Cam's going to take some hits. But when the offensive line keeps protection, we are seven-step dropping and deep shot. Yep. Mm -hmm. Deep yep. shot down the field. This year, I've watched all of the – all of the Panthers games in their entirety the day after mm -hmm. Sunday football because I'm invested in this. I, I think Cam is potentially great still, even yeah. though he hasn't shown it. I told you guys at the beginning of the year, this was a team that I thought could be one of the better teams in the NFC. And here's what I'm seeing from Cam Newton. They are not taking deep shots. Mm -hmm. They Last year, no quarterback threw to the running backs less. This year, last year, he had 44 completions on the season to running backs. Mm -hmm. This year, he has 18 to Christian McCaffrey through three weeks. Wow. They are changing who they are. And the other thing that changed the Panthers, the thing that saved Ron Rivera's job, 
was they started to go for it on fourth downs. They started to not need. Every team in the league has three downs to get a first down, except for the Panthers in 2015. They had four because it was fourth and short. We are going for it. We got big Cam Newton. We got. We, I think they still had Mike Tolbert. We are finding a way to get these fourth downs. They're not doing that anymore. So they, they've got to decide, I think, are we trying to totally change who we are? If so, then it's going to be some growing pains. Right. Or do we just want to get back to who we were and see if that can still be successful? You know what? I, I always said this, right? <clears throat> you think about what Seattle done when they had the chance to be back-to-back, right? Mm-hmm. And I said, if that changes, that may change forever, right? And so exactly what you're saying, I think when Camden was hot, hot, 2015, when that changes, that may change forever. If they, you're, so you're saying if that, that Super Bowl, which while it was one-sided, yeah. it's a six-point game with yeah. the Panthers have the ball. If the, if the Panthers win that Super Bowl, maybe we're seeing a team that never slows down. We're seeing a totally different climb. Right. I yeah. think also, look at the press conference. Mm-hmm. Look at the disappointment. But what I would like to see change is, is go back, because I remember Cam when he was 17. Mm-hmm. His first workout for the University of Florida. He was trying to earn a scholarship from Urban Meyer. Wow. And I had never seen a young leader, I'm talking about energized, galvanized kids from all around the country. It was Friday Night Lights at, at, um, in Gainesville. Mm-hmm. And all these top recruits, Cam Newton was the alpha dog. He was the ringleader. Mm-hmm. He was the cheerleader. And that's the Cam Newton I saw his first couple years in the pro. Yep. Now, I don't know what the latest dance thing is. I don't know if we can bring back the dad. Right. But we need Cam doing something, yeah. having a good time yep. playing football. Cam has always been a kid. Mm-hmm. But now the business of it and him playing quarterback, oh, he needs to have a certain image. Oh, Tom Brady wouldn't do that. Oh, Aaron Rodgers wouldn't do that. Cam, just be yourself. Yeah. So that's what I would like to see. It's not scheme. Mm-mm. I want to see Cam's face. I want to see him on the field, interacting with the fans, and happy. Because yeah. for me, that is the best Cam Newton. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I, I actually shared that with him after a Monday night game. You know, he, he was laying on the ground guys was hitting him and he was getting up grunting and showed up, showing it on his face and I'm like what are you doing you don't show weakness in this game yeah Jim you Brown know, you got yeah, to get up you got to get up immediately and smile I'll be right back yeah. I'll be right back <laughs> and that's what I think he has to Chris is right CeCe's right he has to get back to that like look I'm going to put my shoulder down because I'm going to play this game football which is what we started from childhood mm-hmm. I'm going to run you over and then I'm going to get back up and say I'm going to come right back again and everyone has a style everybody yeah well, there's something right now keeping him from having fun. And I don't know if it's shoulders still bothering him or he just doesn't feel comfortable. We'll have to figure out what it is. Ray, thank you so much yeah, for right. joining us. You're Always really inspired fun. by your workout. Hey, anytime you want to work I'm out. I'm about to go work out now because I'm really inspired. Months and months I've been begging these two and I get goose eggs. Don't so not drink my man Nick's coffee. <laughs> yeah. Okay? <laughs> Welcome back to First Things First. We're joined now by Ray Lewis. Hi, Ray. How are you? What What did you guys miss in the commercial break? We were making fun of our boy Nick over here for how much he's been working out lately. Because sitting next to Ray, it's Jenna literally. But we can tell everybody how you work out. I mean, well, no, that's that was very impressive, Jenna. That's all it was. It was a lead to get back to her. I got anything but this. It's important to exercise. Anything else? I was talking. Please. Uh, all right, all right, we will, we will. Thank you. Ray's got his, his uh, Ravens purple on, so let's discuss. The Steelers are heading to Baltimore to take on the Ravens on Sunday. Ben Roethlisberger says this matchup is a, quote, special game. Ray, I'll start with you. You played 30 games against Pittsburgh in your career. 30. Wow. That's more than anybody else has ever played in the history of this robbery. How much does this matchup mean to you? You know what? It was the one game that every year you just circled on the calendar. Yeah. I, I played in this rivalry, and it was the – I won it when I got to Baltimore. Hey, man, we got a rule on this yeah. show, too. We yeah. need to tell you from yesterday. Yeah. Man, you can't be grabbing us, man. <laughs> you don't even know your own strength. So Chris, I'm going to touch you now. <laughs> okay, no, okay. okay, all right, no yeah. problem. Go he on, almost fell off his chair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I almost snapped my – was just trying to make a point. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> no. Deep bruise. No, but I wanted – I wanted what the Steelers nation had. When we got to Baltimore. Oh, so you ain't had no championship pedigree. No, man. No like, organization. In, in really no history. No history of anything. We're starting over. So when we started to go into Pittsburgh, I'm like, man, this culture is out of it's way out there. But I'm playing and I'm watching. I'm playing against Jerome Bettis and I'm playing against Damani Dawson. And I'm playing against 
old school football players. And I'm like, man, this is crazy. I'm a young kid coming out of college. I'm just running around, you know, <laughs> Damani Dawson just beating the brakes off me. I'm like, how do I beat Damani Dawson? But I'm watching on the sideline, Franco Harris. And I'm saying, man, this history is crazy here in Pittsburgh. So this rivalry started to develop in my mind saying, I got to find out how to switch this to bring it to Baltimore. Like, how do we get this type of energy in Baltimore? And so that was my motto. And so when we started going there, I started making that rivalry very personal. Like, look, we don't like them. They don't like us. Yes. It is what it is. That now. was the Wednesday press conference, Ray Lewis. <laughs> yeah. Like, I want what you got. Like, I want what you got. Like, And, and so I think over, over a course of years, those rivalries started to, like, really grow, really grow, really grow. And then this magic happened, I think, in 1999 going into two, 2000 to when we went to Pittsburgh and it was first down on the one yard line and it took them eight times and they did not get in. Priest Holmes started that game because Jamal Lewis was hurt. And I think the rivalry took a different turn that day because I think Baltimore finally accepted, you know what? We are those dudes. Like we can be those dudes. And so that rivalry, like you don't think about that rivalry, man. When I was growing up, the rivalry that blew me crazy, this just my mind, was the San Francisco 49ers and the Dallas Cowboys. Mm -hmm. 1994, I'm sitting at the crib. I'm like, man, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. Like, I'm in college. Like, can you, can you believe this? And so now that I found myself in a rivalry like that, bro, that's why I played the game, for that type of rivalry. And I, and I don't think no other team will ever have that type of rivalry. That's why these guys this week, it's so simple. It ain't even nothing to think about. You know why? It's no disrespect from we don't like each other, but we respect mm -hmm. the heck out of well, each other. Well, that's what I wanted to yeah. ask you. Like, how much of this is, I assume, especially as a defensive player, you have to, before almost any game, get yourself into a mind frame of aggression, almost anger. Mm -hmm. But it always seemed from the outside, you didn't have to hype yourself up for this game, that it was authentic. Yeah. How, how much of it is... A healthy respect, and how much of it is actually a healthy hate? Like it's a healthy respect because you know who's on the other side. When I'm on the other side and I'm watching Lamar Woodley and I'm watching Troy Palomalu, I'm not going to let them outplay me. So I'm telling Ed, I'm like, Ed, we got to make more plays than they're going to make because they're going to make some plays. And that's what I think when greatness really respects greatness is when you pay attention to greatness because I, I was a fan of watching how dominant their defense was for so many years. CC, yeah. do you get up more for a rivalry than you do for a regular game? Do you feel it the way we do as fans, like when Ray was watching the Niners and the Cowboys? I mean, when you're in it, you feel it? Right. Ray and I are just fortunate that we're able to experience rivalries in our adulthood. But mm -hmm. it really starts when you start playing football. Man. It's the east side versus the west side. The kids over in the projects versus the kids on the other side of the track. Yeah. Where I went to school, Middletown. Versus Cincinnati Princeton, Cincinnati Mola, yeah. St. Ignatius, <laughs> Maslin, the Bulldogs, yeah. the, the Canton McKinley Bulldogs. Those were the big rivalries. And then I was blessed enough to go to a place called Ohio State. Mm. And we got a place just up north called Michigan. And we respect them, but man, man. we got some serious hate for them. Man. All right? So for me, I was able to graduate. So once we went into the league, I knew what a real rivalry was compared to some of these fictitious ones. And in pro football, there's not a whole bunch of them. It's not. But when I went to Minnesota, they traded for Reggie White. Hmm. They traded for Brett Favre. Oh, it was on. Now, Minnesota people will say, well, Chicago's our rival. No, because Chicago wasn't that good. Mm -hmm. It was Green Bay for me because they got my best shot, and there's nothing like beating your rival. And in the NFL, it's, you're so fortunate – most of the time, you get to play them twice. Mm -hmm. So you get them at your place, then you get them at your place every year. So trying to live up to that standard. Yeah. But it starts for us when we're kids. And it graduates to a great university in most instances yep. and then into the NFL. Absolutely. The, for Do you think the this rivalry is one of the reasons that these are two of the franchises, along with New England, not many others, that over the last – Basically, since you talked about since 99 to now, yeah. I can't think of 
a lot of downtime mm -hmm. for either team. Like, they've had bad years. Yeah. But these are two teams that have sustained a level of excellence. Do you think part of that is, man, we can't, we can't go through a rebuilding when we're going to have to, when we're competing with this team each and every year? Mm -hmm. Or am I making that up? Is that, is that no, 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 no. We knew that you could not lose ground in our division. Mm -hmm. Like, you could not. If Pittsburgh added a piece, we needed to add a piece. Like, those are, they were always on the radar. Because if you get out of the AFC North, when, when we was playing in, you got a real chance to win the AFC. Like, like, like mm -hmm. seriously, if you can get out of there healthy enough, you got a real chance. But I think the magic was when you started to look at who to pick up, sometimes you would look at them and say, man, I wish I had him over here. <laughs> you know, like, now you see Mike Wallace in Baltimore that you would never think that Mike Wallace would leave Pittsburgh to come to Baltimore. I think yeah. a lot of the rivalry, too, because the Steelers have championship pedigree from mm -hmm. the ownership. Mm -hmm. And also, they have stability. Yeah. So I would say when Steve Bashotti and they decide to take over Baltimore, they do everything in Baltimore first class. I'm first not saying class. this because Ray is there. Nah, right. I mean, they do everything in a championship way. Before they had championship, mm -hmm. Ozzie Newsom. And then they went out and acquiring players and how they treat those players yeah. and everything. So, yes, there was a rivalry on the field. But if you didn't have the same support from the front office, yeah. it's hard to match the Dallases, the San Francisco's, all those teams that won championships, Washington when mm -hmm. I was there, the Giants. It's hard. When you don't have the resources in the front office to be able to do that, man, it, it, the, the rivalry becomes a little one-sided. Yeah. I want to yeah. ask Ray a quick question here yeah, about yeah. Terrell Suggs yeah. because they, he's still playing in this. And mm -hmm. a story for me, you guys went to Kansas City and won a playoff game Yeah. back when I was still covering the Kansas City Chiefs mm -hmm. doing local radio. I go into the winner's locker room because the loser's locker room is such a bummer. And Ray is getting more perfectly coiffed than this. Like, Ray, Ray said, turns, says to us, listen, I'm going to talk to you guys. Let me get my whole thing together. Yeah, that's the like Michael three Jordan. Piece, the that's whole thing. That's what we learned from Michael Jordan. As you don't, we don't learn that from LeBron. Yeah. We right. learned that from Mike. Okay, fair. You always get okay. dressed, well, yes, wipe your face off, yes, and get sir. your thoughts together. Well, I'm going to tell you yeah. who didn't learn it, Terrell Suggs. Because as we're waiting for Ray, Terrell Suggs comes out of the shower with Justin Talon's like, y'all, I'm ready. And this is the biggest human being I've, at this point, when ever seen in my life. When a towel that tell me if I'm wrong is smaller than the <laughs> circumference of his waist, right. I don't know oh, why. Yeah, but the NFL right. has so much money, purpose. they can't afford that. Of course he did that With that thigh, with his, that thigh show. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> his traps or whatever this muscle is is touching his ears. He looks, he barely yeah. looks human. So this, or how amazed you that he's still playing and playing at the level that he's playing. I mean, not a young guy anymore. Yeah, but it's his maturity now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I want you to watch him play. You see him directing guys where they should go. That's where I think his athletic ability was incredible from the first day he came in. Getting to the quarterback, that's a science that that boy woke up with. He just woke up with that. But his mentality now, to now be that leader, is where I'm so impressed with him. You can see him taking this young defense and piecing them the way I once pieced people. And so now to see his dominance, it's like, man, this kid, he, his, his future is so bright because of his dominance at his later part of his career, right? And, and you, you don't see too many people keep climbing. But I don't think I think Terrell Suggs has made it simple. There's no tackle left or right that can deal with him. Let me teach you something when you go into the locker room. You'll know if a guy likes you. If he's doing the interview with his towel on, he's standing up. That means he likes you. If he decides to sit down on his stool, that means he don't like you. Okay, All right, good watch enough. yourself. Moving on, Odell Beckham Jr. met with Giants owner John Mara on Wednesday. This after making headlines for drawing a penalty for the celebration you are seeing here. Odell spoke with reporters yesterday about his meeting with the owner. Um, we talked. And did you apologize? No, I said we talked. Mr. Mayor and I talked. Going forward, what does that mean to us? Mm -hmm. um, him and I talked. We had a discussion, private discussion behind in his office. So we talked about it, him and I. I'll, I'll address this to both of you. You guys played. Have you ever had a one-on-one uh, -on -one discussion with the team owner? Has that ever happened? And, and is how big of a deal is that, and why didn't this go through McAdoo? <laughs> yeah, uh, I've never been called to the owner's office, called to the principal's office. Now, I've had many one-on-one -on -one discussions with our owner. Mr. Bowen was great. I used to... Uh, Used to sit in the weight room and and do you know shine Super Bowl. Rings. But it wasn't no, 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 no. something you did. No, on not no, no. So uh, no, I, I again, you know, I said this yesterday, and I'll, I'll go back to it. You can have those one on one meetings, and you can do those things. And I've been benched in this league. It was a, it was one of the 
one of the most humiliating things that's ever happened to me, to be benched. And it's, in my mind, the only thing that really resonates with players is to say, I'm going to take recess away from you. Gonna, for a, can I ask for a real time. quick, were yeah. you benched? I, I apologize for bringing up yeah, a no, humiliating no, no. experience. No. Were you benched because of something like what Odell did, misbehavior no, 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 or no. poor play? No. Um, I, yeah, it was it, it, in their mind, it was I was a young player and they were scared of having a young player play against the Giants who the Redskins never beat back gotcha. then. So, you know, you can call it poor play, you can call it whatever. But, yes, but it wasn't because it was, you did something like this. It wasn't could you see them benching Odell? Could At the end of all this, could that even possibly be uh, well, No, I can't see the Giants. I, I can't see the Giants benching Odell because the Giants don't have the heart. They don't have the intestinal fortitude to do that to one of their players. If you're not going to bench him when he's fighting with Josh Norman and, and, I mean, embarrassing your franchise, then, you know, you're going to have a stern talking to with Odell Beckham, and, but nothing nothing is going to change. I mean, that to me, that just doesn't change players. And I'm not saying, hey, you don't get to play this entire game, but hey, listen, man, you you have to sit down and watch. Because here's the thing that I always that I always think about: there's nothing worse than to be a healthy scratch for a while and to know that you're letting your team down. And the only way that that truly resonates in my mind with players is when you have to stand there, come stand by me. Come stand by the head coach, and let's watch our offense run a couple series without you. But, Mark, he doesn't think he's letting his team down. Well, that's well, – and let me ask you this. The, if we're going to bench someone on the Giants, shouldn't it be Eric Flowers? Shouldn't – this is the one thing, and, I, and I'm and i sure I'm on the other side of this from you guys. Sure, sure. But what, if we're going to be out there, we have had Ben McAdoo call out mm-hmm. Eli. And it was light. I'm not saying it was it was bad. It was a big right. thing, but he was like, we need better play from a quarterback position. We've had the owner – now call out Odell when he has been in just really three or four healthy quarters of football already far and away their most productive offensive player this season. Why Why does no one call out the bad player? Only the good player for, for not playing either up to his full potential in Eli or Odell for something that has nothing to do with football. Like, w- w- where's the press conference where it's like, what do you guys need? We need our left tackle to stop getting baptized by Ziggy Ansah every single right. play. Where's that? Uh, well, coaches, this is the way it, ro- it works, Nick. Coaches will not criticize you when you are defeated physically. All right? Mm-hmm. It's different if it's a technique thing. The coaches will try to coach you up. But a physical thing? They can't, they can't criticize you because you're not going to get taller. You're not going to get stronger. So what they try to do is give him some help or give him some confidence. It wouldn't do him any good to tear down this player. The less the talent of the player, the less the criticism he's going to be able to take in front of the media because he's already struggling mentally. Now, you said uh, Mr. Mara called out Odell. How did he call him out? Uh, what did he say? The quote to the newspaper. He said he was very disappointed, okay. very unhappy, I think is exactly okay. is that- what he said. Well, the, I, he owns the team. Of, I'm not saying he's not allowed to do it, CC, and I'm not saying it, it put Odell into I therapy. Mean, my goodness, but I'm, I'm I, just I'm I, saying of all the guys that John Mara has said something but, negative about, Odell's the one. What did he say negative? That he was very unhappy with what he did. He said he was disappointed. Yeah, that's negative. That's the truth. Okay, that, that's but, <laughs> right. but the but wait, point, we're having two different conversations. Okay. You're talking about whether we should call out players for poor play, regardless of who they are. And we're, you're talking about whether Odell was even called out for what he did. It's, it's not being called out. This guy is the owner of the team. He can answer any way. He is actually the spokesperson for the team. What you guys are missing is that the chain of command was missed. And he t- the coach addressed the issue after the game. He addressed the issue on Monday. Obviously, Mr. Marr didn't think like it was addressed because he wouldn't have had to bring Odell into the principal's office because they went past the head coach. Because for me, every time I've been in trouble, I've been in trouble with the head coach. And Denny Green, it don't need to go no further. I'm the highest court right. in the land. If you have to go to the owner, you then really messed up. Now, for me, it's bad optics for Odell because Odell did not want the Marr family saying anything that might be related to his lack of of maturity. The next conversation Odell wanted to have with Mr. Morrow was, when are we going to get this money done? But no, you in my office talking about stuff that you had control over. So 
Maybe over the course of this show, we'll get beyond, oh, he called him out. Oh, he did this. This is pro sports. It, it, okay, so what, ha what comes from that? So, well, so now he has the meeting. So what changes? What happens? How did the, it, how did it happens any time you go to your so boss's office. So we're not going to so see him do this again? I, how long have yeah. you been covering sports? Well, I'm just there asking. There is no way to be able to predict that. But of course, but if you're telling me all he wanted was to not be I, called in by the I, owner and he got called in so by the owner. I, I, would say, I would say this. Going to your point and going to the organization in general. Here's, and, and CeCe's point of, of bad optics, here's the issue for me, is that when the owner has to get involved in that, do you know what it says about your organization? It says the organization, the structure of your organization is not right. Right. They didn't have a leader in the locker room. They don't have a strong enough head coach. Go ahead, Stan. Right. No, exactly. So, I mean, by doing that, you've essentially emasculated the power of your head coach. Because guess what? My head coach ain't going to take care of it. So now I've got to get called up to the owner's office. And, and so from a, just a pure organizational structure, your organizational structure is broken. And when that happens, guess what happens to players? When your head coach gets up in front of you and addresses the team, everybody goes, yeah, all right. Here we go again. Yeah. Here's our, here's our head coach. They because, tune out. Because, you know, it's, it's our owner that's, that's, you know, doing whatever he's doing in the press or who, who called up Odell Beckham Jr. Because, you know, ultimately you look at it as a player like, well, because our head coach can't handle it. So now our owner has to get involved. And, and these, are just, these are just bad situations for the organization. Let's go back a week ago. Zeke in trouble far as lack of effort. Team leaders talk to him. Head coach talked to him. You might not like the head coach, but the head coach talked to him. Zeke said at his first press conference, you know something? I was wrong. I'm going to get that corrected. Mm -hmm. That's what you'd like to see. You'd like it not to have to go to the owner. So... I know you're friends with Odell. I'm just curious what was going through his head. Why Why? Why not say that? Odell, why not say, oh, you know oh, what? Didn't like the way I acted. Maybe I could have done it, but I had to go see the what It's done. It's, let's move on. Won't I can't get in yet. Odell's head, but I'm going to tell you about any other wide receiver. It won't be his last time in the principal's office. Okay. <laughs> I'm just, just not happy with the answer. Jenna, Jenna, I'm not listen, happy with the answer. Listen, I'm, like, I, I know we're I'm going to try to explain it's this so to you. It's so important to Jenna, be Odell. Jenna, Maybe stop. Just Jenna, 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 Jenna stop. I'm trying to explain this to you. Yeah. Not everyone is as calm, cool, and collected <laughs> and professional as you would like to be. Other people have Especially different strengths different strengths and weaknesses. Odell, you don't hold on. to the owner's office. Jenna, it's a huge for the deal. love of God, hear this, please. Not everyone makes the correct decision, even if logically, listen, I don't want to be called in the principal's office, so don't do things that get you called in the principal's office. Nick, Somebody's you don't think I hear you? He just made the reference, he compared him to Zeke. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying, okay, if that's what Zeke did and you said what Zeke did was well handled, why not? Because they're human beings that react differently. I was just thinking how they attacked it. That's yeah. all I was talking They're about. different people that react differently to situations. Different, Odell, one of Odell's, Odell's one of the best people in the world correct. at catching the football. Yes. He appears to be one of the worst people in the league at self-control. That's not going to change week three to week four thank you for listening to the first things first podcast remember leave us a review and tell us what you think subscribe to the podcast on apple podcasts and catch us on fs1 monday through friday 6 30 a.m eastern on fs1 for chris carter nick wright i'm jenna wolf so long everybody Welcome to a Wednesday edition of the First Things First podcast. I'm your host, Jenna Wolf. Catch us Monday through Friday, 6.30 a.m. Eastern on FS1. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts. Tell us what you think and leave us a review. Time now to bring in Nick and the Hall of Famer, Chris Carter. All right, let's talk some football. We're going to start with the Dallas Cowboys. We all saw protest after protest around the league during the national anthem this week. What we didn't see was the person who started the movement, either on the field or off, Colin Kaepernick. That, as we continue to wonder when or if he will be back in the NFL. Jerry Jones was asked in a radio interview why Kaepernick is still unemployed. Take a listen. But it's real obvious to me that it's been based upon teams assessing what he can bring to the team as a player. And uh, make no mistake about it, uh, if team needs quarterback, they're looking to see if you can help them move that football down the field. And performance is, the, in my mind, is the complete criteria for getting on a squad at this time of the year for sure. So, Nick, let me start with you. Jerry Jones said it. If a team needs a quarterback, he, he, you might be seeing Colin Kaepernick in the league. Are you buying, though, that Kaepernick isn't in the NFL because of football reasons? Of course not. And I don't think Jerry Jones actually 
believes it's because of football reasons. Because Jerry Jones is a smart guy. Jerry Jones has been around the National Football League for as long as I've been alive. Yes. And Jerry Jones, while he might not know this exact number, he knows that this is true, that in league history, there have been 143 quarterbacks who've thrown at least 200 passes in their age 29 season, Mm -hmm. who the following season wanted to play, and 142 of them had jobs. The one who did not is Colin Kaepernick. Jerry Jones knows that Colin Kaepernick last year throw out everything that he did running the football, where he led the league in yards per carry, where he was, according to advanced metrics, the league's most deadly red zone threat. Throw all that out, stuff he did with his legs. Jerry Jones knows that Colin Kaepernick was around 22nd or 23rd in quarterback effectiveness last season in a league that's going to employ 90 guys. Jerry Jones knows that while people sling the arrow of Kaepernick being 4-20 and 20 in his last 24 starts, that Josh McCown was 2-22 and 22 in his last 24 and got $6 million a year from the Jets. Jerry Jones knows that Colin Kaepernick was doing this with Jeremy Curley, a guy named Patton, and the bad Selleck in the league. Garrett Selleck is his leading pass catchers. <laughs> Guys who through two weeks of the season had four combined catches. Jerry Jones knows all those things. And yet Colin Kaepernick's unemployed. So no, of course it's not because of football reasons. And Jerry Jones knows it's not because of football reasons. Uh, Nick, you bring up great points. But, Jenna, I'm not going to go by what Jerry Jones knows because I've been associated with the league just as long. I'm going to go by what I know. All right? Jerry Jones has one quarterback on his roster that's better than Cap, and that's Dak. He's a superstar. All right? So you saying Jerry Jones knows that. He's got two people he's paying right now. All right? Who are the quarterbacks in Dallas, Nick? Kellen Moore. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, let's, let's just stop with him. All right? Since Jerry knows all this stuff, all right? Colin Kaepernick will always, even if Colin Kaepernick never plays another down, Kellen Moore will never reach to be a starter the way Cap was. So you're giving Jerry too much credit. All right? I'm going to tell you what I know. There's a bunch of bums playing quarterback in the NFL. All right? There's five to seven starters and all the backups. Like all the backups, you could make a case for Colin Kaepernick. Now, I do understand fit. I preach system. Yes, but they fit these guys who can't play in the any system compared to saying that only Cap can be in a certain system with a certain coach. So I'm going to tell you what I do know. Jerry, Jerry is trying to please the other 31 owners. He's also trying to help out Roger Goodell in the PR with the NFL. All right? Because Jerry Jones, you giving him a lot of credit. This is what I know. Jerry Jones was not for any type of formal protest. Jerry Jones got forced on his knee on Monday night. You know why, Nick? Because the other 15 games that preceded him. And he didn't want to be embarrassed. And he had plenty of players who wanted to show some type of support for Colin Kaepernick and the others around the league that had been in full display. I'm going to tell you what Jerry Jones know, too. He wrote that check for Donald Trump for the inauguration. All right? He gave him a million dollars. He's been outspoken against protest. You know, saying he's correlating it like a lot of people that the protest is about disrespecting the flag. Mm -hmm. And Jerry knows that that's not true. So you might give Jerry a credit for a lot of things he knows. I got to go by what I know, Nick. And I've seen too many guys signed where Colin Kaepernick was not even given an offer, not even a tryout. Not even a tryout. And I'm going to finish with this. He said it's based on performance. Tell me one guy that's gotten signed besides Jay Cutler that's more accomplished as a passer than Colin. You know, so it, Jerry can't be right. Jenna, as you rock back and forth. Uh, 
nothing changed on Sunday. Nothing changed. The owners didn't change their feeling towards Kaepernick based on what happened on Sunday. They may have all unified. A lot of them may have knelt. A lot of may have them interlocked arms. It didn't change the way they felt about Colin Kaepernick. We have danced around and had this exact same conversation. I will say not everyone agrees, but the three of us agree that Colin Kaepernick is talented enough to play in the NFL. That goes, that goes without question. But these owners still feel the exact same way they did before all of this happened. Can I, can I ask you a question about that? Because you said nothing changed on Sunday. No, Monday. nothing changed towards, towards the, owners, the owners, towards no. Kaepernick. Here is what I think did change. And I think it is perfect that Jerry Jones is the one saying this because Jerry Jones, to me, is the face of it. You know what did change? The teams with Jerry Jones at the forefront, national television, taking a knee. You know what they debunked? This idea that distractions are something they care about. Did I, Am I crazy? Yes. Did, did, did Jerry Jones not think he's going to be asked about this? My players are going to be asked about this. It's, it's, what it's, is different, any, it's different. No, well, that no, is no, the no, conversation no. being had in the NFL right now. And, when, and every team is getting asked. It is not like it's just with the oh. Cowboys. If Kaepernick is on that Cowboys roster, there is a swarm of media Every as opposed, day for the rest okay. of the season, Interesting. As a, asking as a, every single as a, person. As opposed to the last 30 years no. in Dallas. I'm, oh. come, you, you said that what happened on Sunday isn't a distraction. I, I, it, it now you is. Had, Jenna, you cannot convince me that Jerry kneeling did not lead to more questions. It led to this. Yes. It led to the discussion. But, but the teams recognized it doesn't actually matter. And so I just... If I, if I can for a moment, because I know, Jenna, you, there's one point on this, you and I, there's actually two points we really agree on. One is that Cap's good enough to play. The other is that it is curious that Cap has not spoken. Like, Chris talked to him on the street, and Chris had a conversation with him. He, he talked was to Sean King. He media outlet right, on that, the street. That, that Cap here. has not said, hey, 60 minutes, I'll sit down. We agree on that, but can I, can I level set real quick on this? I just want, for the audience as a whole, I, there are a few things that are going around about Colin Kaepernick that are just factually inaccurate. If I could debunk them quickly. People that want to say it's about performance. I have people tweet to me every day, oh, if he's so good, why was he benched for Blaine Gabbert? But he wasn't. Bang, Blaine Gabbert was benched for him. Oh, he, oh, well, you know what Cap shouldn't have done? Cap shouldn't have opted out of his deal with the Niners. Well, that would be a good point. If John Lynch, the GM of the Niners, wasn't on the record saying if he hadn't opted out, we would have cut him. Absolutely. Well, Cap wants $10 million. No one credible is reporting that. No. Cap has not said it. His people have not said it. Well, Cap doesn't want to play anymore. Chris, you talk to him. He wants to play. Okay. So, oh well, the thing is, Cap's not popular in the locker room. Except his teammates gave him the highest honor with the Niners. Except both of his pro coaches have advocated for him. Oh, well, Cap just isn't good enough. Except the two best people in the world, maybe ever, at playing quarterback, Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady, both on the record saying he's good enough. We get it. He's good enough. You have a ton of numbers to back it up. He's good enough to play. He mentioned to Chris he wants to play. Make a case for yourself, Colin Kaepernick. If Sunday wasn't a big enough stage for you to at least tweet something, you don't want to get out and say it wasn't? His message has no, gotten no, no, confused. No no. No, 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 wait a Let second. Let me just finish my point. Go right ahead. Let me just say, if Sunday wasn't a big enough stage for you to at least say, hey, how about just this? Thank you. Or now thank you understand. You for what? Or, thank you for being on my they side. Kneeling, for being with, they, they, they weren't, weren't kneeling, kneeling with him. But the none message of, got, they would the never message have got diluted. On, on I Sunday, that. they would never have knelt on Sunday if this was not for Colin Kaepernick. Do you agree with me? This all started from Colin Kaepernick, but maybe he it does. started. They were not kneeling for Kaepernick. They were kneeling because they were challenged by the White House, which would never have been an issue if it wasn't for Colin Kaepernick. He started all of this. Either say something for the protest. That's or just say what you would do, that Jenna. He, no, and that don't make it right or wrong. Uh, it doesn't make it right, right or wrong. Everyone I'm always likes to play, live through another person. If you want right? to play football, tell the world you want to play football. If you want to say he has that this told is the more, world. he told you he will not talk to anyone. Someone no came NFL up to him and owner, asked him a so question. So no NFL owner will call him. No one's made him an offer, Jenna. No one will give him a workout. So now he should just talk to random people. No, when his messages random are, people, he has the stage. 
What he stage? A, he has a Twitter account where everyone's following Jenna, him, and everyone has a microphone. It in doesn't his face. matter, Jenna, if the owners will not sign him. All right, Jerry Jones put it out there. Oh, it's about his talent, and that's what the owners are hiding behind. But that is a flat out lie, and I believe you're wrong in thinking that Cap, just because you would do it, does not make it right for every person to do it. I, Cap has done a significant job in setting the tone for where we are right now. Now, if he don't want to speak, I support Cap. So I support if he wants to speak or if he does not want to speak. He has the right to not speak. But Why do you think it would make a difference? Can, let me just ask this. Hold I would on. love, you, love to answer that because question. Because I feel like it would just and no, no, no. would make you feel better. But do you think it would help him get signed? You want to talk just football? Here's what he does. And it's what all other athletes do when they want something. This is what we have. It is an incredibly powerful tool. Put out a couple of videos of you practicing. I know you don't want that. And I, and I know that some people don't want to see it. And I know he doesn't have to do it and shouldn't feel like he has to do it. Put a couple of videos of you out catching a ball. Put a couple of videos of you out training, going through some like None of the other guys practices. are doing it. None of those other guys Odell can't did it play. instead of OTAs. He oh, was showing oh. videos of him playing and practicing. I'm just saying, give us an idea but that this is think, the direction Jenna, Jenna, you're going I, I ask you this as one of the smartest people I know. Do you think that actually helps? Or I does that just a, check this off the list? I think this is the only way he's got even the, a remote chance of a shot at getting a call by an owner. So that they can't say, well, I don't know if he wants to play. I don't know if he's in shape. I don't think he's good enough. Squash all those rumors. You now got it seven, really you got is. got seven owners, all right, seven of the 32. We know San Francisco's not going to give him a job. And we know that there's a, a limited number of teams for fit. We got seven owners that gave Donald Trump a million dollars for his inauguration. So you think he's going to those teams? All I'm okay. saying is put yourself in a position where you he, could say, I literally did everything, and now they did it. it. It's, not Cap's, it's not Cap's fault. The NFL is about the 1,600 best players, and today, as we sit, it's not the best 1,600 players because Cap is not on the field. Ray Lewis joins us this morning. Hey, Ray, how you doing? Hey, good morning. Good Thanks for you, being Ray. with us. Absolutely. Uh, so a day of protests and unity around the NFL started early on Sunday morning when the Ravens and the Jaguars took the field in London. A bunch of players locked arms, were even joined by Jags owner Shad Khan. Some players took knees, and it appeared that you, Ray Lewis, joined him. Ray, tell us about what happened uh, on Sunday. Yeah, I think it was, a, it was a totally different culture. You know, I'm talking about around the league, around the league, that um, I'm in London, and the only thing that you can talk about is... Ray, why, why were you in London? Oh, just for the people. Yeah, the NFL um, brought me to London. Right, you, you know, and as a, a number and, of other players. Yep, me and Jonathan Ogden. Okay. Um, Steve Smith was over there. Um, Ed Reed was over there, and so a bunch of Ravens. They brought a bunch of Ravens back to oh. go to go in the community, hang out with the kids. Um, we went to we went to the tower, um, the cathedral. Just saw a lot of different things. Learned a lot of different things. And it was just, it was one of the most incredible experiences I think I've had in my life, like in London. I've been to London a lot, but to go back and not have nothing to think about, just to actually view the city. So, yeah, so we was in London just hanging out. And uh, where was I going? About the, your yeah. decision to take part in the yes. demonstration. Yeah, and so I want to always correct you when, when people say that. You say, because when people say I took part in a demonstration, took part in a demonstration mean I would have took one knee. I took two knees. One knee is for the team, two knees is for Jesus. And you ask yourself, I want you to, I want us to think about something, right? We're here, and for the last three days, every piece of conversation is about, oh, who's kneeling, who's standing? It's never been about the flag, right? But watch this. How quickly have we forgot about Hurricane Harvey? How quickly have we forgotten about Irma? Oh, yeah. Quick. How quickly have we forgot about the church shooting that just happened in Nashville? I told Shannon something last night as a brother. This fight for me, I'm done with. Because it's a bunch of everybody's talking. But I can guarantee you this. There's no person that you'll ever meet that wakes up every day right. There's nobody that wakes up every day right. But we'll find ourselves in a conflict of chaos. And our league is one of the leagues that relieves people from that tension of stress because we can watch a football game, because we can have excitement, 
because we can get away from the everyday stresses of life. And now you have these young kids going into football games, and the last thing on their mind is football. But if you're me, when I played the game, when I got up every morning, I fell on my knees to pray that the Lord will bring me out safely in a game that's so harsh. You you mentioned, I watched your lesson on Inside the NFL. Mm-hmm. I mean, the audience probably isn't familiar with that. When you mentioned yeah. Shannon, Shannon Sharp from Undisputed, yeah. Ed's comments on Monday, and mm-hmm. you, I know you and Shannon have spoken. I, mm-hmm. I just want to make sure people know what we're talking about. Yeah. You've made the, it's been very clear that it's important to you to make the distinction between the one knee and the two knees. Mm-hmm. And that you would previous and post, I don't disavow, is maybe the wrong word, but you have objected to players taking one knee. Yes. What, yep. Any protest. Okay, so you can you explain the distinction that you're drawing mm-hmm. between what you did and the guys who you're locking arms with, what they did? I'm a teammate. I'm a brother. Just so happened I'm not playing that game anymore. So the comments that Trump made or whatever this guy makes, no, I'm not offended by that because I'm not the one that's doing all that. But I see so many guys, and it's rage, and every tweet, and owners are tweeting, and there are all these people are tweeting. And I'm like, really? So what, do, so what does a leader do? What does a leader do? A leader leads. A leader doesn't go out and say, oh, I, I got to. No, I looked, at my, I looked at these young babies, and I said, I got to do something that only God will understand. And I asked myself, what would Jesus do in a time of this chaos? And I took both knees. To hey, Ray, yeah. I was on the NFL sideline Sunday, too. Mm-hmm. I was at the Eagles yeah. and the Giants game. Yeah. One of the reasons why I was there mm-hmm. was our friend Odell. Yeah. Um, I talked to Odell before the game. Mm-hmm. He was conflicted. I heard you talk about that. Now, I made a conscious decision, Ray, mm-hmm. to leave that field before the game started. Right. The reason why? Because it wasn't about me. Mm-hmm. And the optics would have not been good. Are you concerned with the optics based on what you said? Also, the comments with Colin Kaepernick, because we're getting a long way away from Colin Kaepernick. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm Chris, I, 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 I want to make sure we control all context, because that's where everything always gets messed up at. Your decision as a man to do what you did is your decision. Yeah, absolutely. And, right? It's not about being right It's or not being about wrong, that. Because but it's, the, it's a choice that I had thought out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, also, Which Ray, I didn't. Also, Ray, mm-hmm. I saw you on TV. Yeah. And your decision, yeah. it helped me. Yeah. Because that was before. Mm-hmm. It was early. It was a 9, 9.30 kickoff. Yeah. yeah. So I, I saw you. Mm-hmm. And I don't know why you were on the field. I thought you might be there for the coin toss. But I knew being part of that brotherhood would bring you to where you were. I saw you when the guys went to take a knee. You were on one knee. Mm -hmm. Something changed. Mm -hmm. And I saw you. You moved your legs out, and you got on two knees. The one thing I've been trying to explain to them was that is a really, really special moment, the national anthem and you and the prayers that we say before the game. Now, I was conflicted seeing you Mm -hmm. on the field with the players, given that Kaepernick and the Mm -hmm. conversation about him and all these other distractions, and that guy still wasn't playing. Yeah, but see, every time it happens this way, because we take the story and we twist it to back. this This has absolutely nothing to do with Colin Kaepernick. Absolutely nothing. That's why I think you're missing the whole point. No, no, no. Hold on. Listen to me. Listen to me. When you say, when we say... So people taking a knee now has nothing to do with no, Colin listen, Kaepernick. Yeah, I'm talking about me. Okay. Me. All right. That's why I keep saying yes, we okay, always I got that. keep confusing this. When I dropped on two knees, I, I did the coin toss. I was there for the coin toss. Okay, I was yes. watching the coin toss. Okay. I walked the little kid out. Right. So that's toss. the reason why you're on the field. That's the reason okay. why right. I'm even on the field. Right. And so I'm caught in this thing when, we, when we're walking back. And, and so when we got there, because I want to make sure I keep this where it is. When you think about what people say when you're not close to Hurricane Irma or Hurricane Harvey or whatever, right? What do you say? We send our thoughts and prayers. Yes. That's what we say. That's what we say. Mm-hmm. 
As a leader, I took a step to say, in the midst of chaos, right. I'm praying. I'm not, I'm not, I told Shannon this last night. We keep talking about Kaepernick and Trump. Man, I'm, I'm, listen, the issue is I'm watching babies not playing the game that we only get one chance at. Honor your moments. You gotta honor your moments. You know this, because when they're done, they're done. I got a question for yeah. you. Go ahead. Yeah. Ray, this is about the this is about the best players ever played this game. Mm -hmm. I'm disturbed by the fact that a player who took a knee is not being signed to an NFL team. Mm -hmm. And now we got hundreds of guys taking the knee for different stuff. When this guy can't get a job, when he said he wasn't going to take a knee this year, he can't be gainfully employed. If 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 I let if I let you or anyone else draw me into that discussion. Well, the truth of the matter I, because, is, right. Because that's not the truth. The truth of the matter is, if we're talking about a signing, we're talking about a is guy. Is Colin Kaepernick good enough to play in the NFL, right? I, I, I've always said that. Okay. All right. Did Colin Kaepernick lose his job before, before we started all this? Absolutely. No, no he didn't. No, 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 no. Listen to me. Listen to me. When Colin Kaepernick, whether he got ready to do whatever he was going to do, you, as well as Shannon, I'm going to say this again. Y'all keep few confusing this. Today, I go before the Lord and I rebuke all evil that you will not put words in my mouth. I love you as a brother. I love Shannon as a brother. But listen to me. No, 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 no. Because this is where it always gets out of hand. Can Colin Kaepernick play in the league? Absolutely. Is that my decision to make? Absolutely not. No, but Ray, Ray, hold on. Listen, and I don't know you nearly as well as Chris knows you, but I think you know I respect you. Yeah. And we've had nothing but good interactions. So this is me, something of an outsider. To, to now say you're removing yourself from all of it. Ray, you were, you were one of the faces of the guys that met with the president. You yeah. were. Like, that was, that was a conscious decision yeah. as a grown man. You, you were the one that broke the news that the Ravens were about to sign him and then changed their minds. So I and don't you understand. were trying to help that make that happen. I don't yeah, understand. I talked to, I talk to other people as well. Uh, John Wooden, Jim Brown. Yeah, yes. a lot of a lot of people. Well, I do a lot of stuff. Of course, no, and I, I'm not doubting. That. Yeah. I'm and, not doubting. And we say that to give you credit. But those, but John Wooden right now isn't in the news. It, it, J J it, I'm, why why would, are you right now in this moment removing yourself from it when it feels like you were one I, of the guys? You keep missing my point. I apologize if I. I am removing myself from rhetoric that ends up being nothing if we're just talking if we're having debate shows just talking and you think you're right and you think you're right and shannon thinks he's right and i'm thinking my right it's irrelevant like i told shannon if we do not come together as brothers if me and shannon me and shannon can argue at the house all day long but when you get on television, you can't speak the same exact way because if you do, somebody takes your side, somebody takes your side, somebody says, oh, Ray Lewis is the biggest jerk ever because he don't believe in Colin Kaepernick. That's so much bull. And I'm not and I'm not going to let you or no one else put me in that position I, and, anymore. And Ray, listen, no, listen. I'm not, I'm not trying nobody to Nobody has to position. explain anything to me anymore. All I'm saying is let's have an educated conversation because I keep, I, I've, I've watched this happen too many times. I've watched people go and say, well, do I call it Kaepernick? And that has nothing to do with Ray Lewis. Okay, and hold on. And, and you, keep, <laughs> you keep bringing up Shannon, and I, and with respect to that, that's got nothing to do with, with Chris or I. Know, I. But man. And, it, and, and, and this is, if, if, if Shannon had never said anything, I, there were questions that I, as a guy that knows you, watched you, that the whole situation would have. So take, take the entire Shannon thing out of it. Right. My question for you is, given the fact that you are someone that met with President Trump, yeah. Given what he said Friday, yeah. given what you had said, and given your relationship to the Kaepernick situation, do you feel the same way about all of those things that you did Thursday that you do today? Like, we, did anything change for you from Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Yes, what changed is we need prayer. We need prayer. Colin Kaepernick need a job. But, but maybe. Maybe. That, 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 absolutely. 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 I mean, he deserves the same right if that he does, we've lived out. If he does. And guess what? Chris Carter will no, get no. up, Paul, because you're right today. No, 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 Ray. But I'm not, it's, I'm, it's not a matter of being right. But you, you mentioned the Bible. Let me yeah. tell you what the Bible says. Tell me what, what it says. What you do to the least of them, uh -huh. you do unto yeah. me. And it 
also says love thy neighbor as thyself. Absolutely. Yeah, and, so, and we're trying to do that. So if we're trying to do that, then we have to create a culture of what prayer really looks like. We have to cre- we pray when we we pray before we come out the locker room. So why don't we pray in front of the entire stadium? At my son's high school, at Bishop Moore High School, they used to always pray that everybody will understand each other and come out safely. I keep telling us the only thing, I'm not frustrated about anything. I just want to make sure because we get on TV and it sounds great. But then you have all of these people who can't understand the intellect of what we're talking about. And then they take this thing as hate and this and that. I have put, I've said this before. I have put Kaepernick's name in my Bible. I pray for this kid. That's, man, that's what I'm built to do. Why did I drop on two knees in London? Because I'm praying for our country that we stop most of this divisiveness and stop just making everybody get on one side or another. You you can have an opinion in America and still be black. You can have an opinion in America and not be racist. You can have a you can have an opinion about this topic, and simply all I'm saying is, if, if you want anything from Ray Lewis, we got to go back to prayer. We got to go back to loving each other. Mark Schler just said to getting off this set, the biggest thing we're missing, and that's love in this country. Ray, there ain't no subject we done been through everything. everything. There ain't no subject me and you can't talk about. And I'm going to love you. But our babies. But, I, I, but, but, but do our babies understand that intellect? Because we are because we are displaying this in front of our kids. That's, but I feel like that's, that's your gripe with someone other than Chris. No, that's not, Chris, that's no, not Chris, a gripe. Chris, no, not gripe. It's the wrong word. Yeah. Chris and I haven't had your name in, in our mouths on any of this. What we have done is, now that you're here, mm-hmm. have questions. And I, it, it feels to me like you have some Frustration Mm-mm. with things said on uh, on in other platforms that got nothing to do with this. There are <laughs> questions that w- we want to ask you. You've made it clear where you stand on this, whether people agree or disagree. Nobody's questioning your blackness. Nobody's questioning where. I don't think anyone's questioning where your heart is. Mm-hmm. I think qu- qu- people question when they saw you on two knees. They question the consistency. You have made it very clear. You draw a huge distinction between one knee and two knees. You've now made it clear why you did it. But it, none of it that none of that undercuts things done before, but I do think... That, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes plenty of sense, actually. No, we appreciate you coming on, man. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Always. Absolutely, yeah. man. The Steelers made headlines on Sunday when they elected to stay in the tunnel for the national anthem. Ben Roethlisberger came out and said, quote, he lost sleep over how the team handled the situation, saying he wished the team had been on the field. Head coach Mike Tomlin was asked how the Steelers can find a middle ground with their demonstrations. Hey, man, that, that's for you political um, beatniks to, to ponder. We, we, we're, we're a football group, man. You're asking us about middle ground. You're asking us about right or left. We're a football group. That's what you guys don't understand. We don't care, largely professionally speaking. We have personal opinions, yes. Professionally, we're about to kick a ball off. You guys ever thought to, to, to wonder what's going through a, man, a man's head as he stands there respectfully and listens to the anthem? He's probably thinking about a myriad of things that's going to happen when that ball kicks off. If you asked him after the game who did the anthem, they probably couldn't tell you. Anybody ever think about that? So, guys, I, I loved what he had to say. I listened to it two or three times. I loved how he I, said it. He was just mad. punching He's you with just, each word. He was right there. And, and it brought up a lot of things that people that have never played the game never thought about. So you have a few minutes, two, three minutes, whatever it is, when the National Anthem is playing. And the minute that's done, like, you're going to battle. And I don't think we realize how much is probably going through your heads when you're sitting there and you're preparing for the game and it's the only amount of, the only, like, beat of, of, of like, solitude you will have for the next, like, three or four hours. Could you both talk about what he was referring to and, and what those few minutes right before the game is like for you and are you thinking about the national anthem or are you thinking about a million other things there are several moments that when you retire from this game people ask you what do you miss and you always miss the locker room because the group of individuals you'll never be a part of such a unique broad young affluent ambitious group the rest of your life Like, we're very, very fortunate to have long careers. And and we've gone on to do other jobs and have another career. But 
Mark will tell you, it's nothing like being in the NFL. There's two big moments before the game. One is when you bow and say the Lord's Prayer in the locker room. Mm -hmm. And then the referee knocks on the door until you got two minutes to get to the field. Once you get to the field, I was taught by Buddy Ryan from my first game. He showed us a clip where he was videotaping the national anthem. He said, if you want to get a fast way out of Philadelphia, disrespect the national anthem. Don't have your helmet in, in, in your right arm underneath you. Don't have your toes on the line. I will cut you. If I can cut you in the middle of the game, I'll cut you in the middle of the game. But if I see the film after the game, I'll cut you immediately after the game. Now, as far as the national anthem, because only a few people play this, play this game. To me, that was the moment where, yes, it meant something to me. I was so proud to be an American, so proud for the opportunity. It's presented to me and my family through football. The next thing I would do was always say a prayer because you're a fool to think that you can go into an NFL game and not lose your life. I used to tell God, I want to go into this game, and I want to come out of this game. I was praying for the safety of every player. I never prayed for success. I prayed for the safety of every man on that field that we could walk off that field afterwards. So the national anthem, it does play a huge role in the NFL and in getting ready for a game. But the transition from hearing that song to what you're getting ready to go through, the physical combat for the next three hours, it's a tough transition. And there's a lot of things going through your mind. But for me, it was about being safe and about being thankful for the opportunity that football was presenting to me. I, you know what? I couldn't say it any better. You guys have to understand that for me throughout my career, there was never a game, including preseason games, that I didn't vomit in a trash can before I went out to play. Yes. I was so nervous about, you know, not only my performance, but most importantly, and not letting my teammates down. Like, not making a mistake that cost us a game. I just was so nervous about playing this game. It didn't matter who I was playing against, and it didn't matter if it was preseason. I will throw up in a trash can. That's just the way it was. And going out. What was happening back here before yes, you got I was on having set? earlier. Right. Yes, I, I, it's sure. just a tradition now. Um, <laughs> but as as I went out and took the field, now you have to remember there was, I don't know how many national anthems I ever actually went out for because this is this is something during the course of our career that not partial. everybody did it. Yeah, it yes. was it was a partial thing. So. Um, I don't you were, really, you're saying during your career, during, some of the time you guys stayed well, in the locker room. Right. No, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. You know, there was a. There's this whole paid for patriotism aspect right. to the national anthem. Where I don't know that it, when I was in Washington that we ever actually went out for a national anthem. I don't remember doing. I remember doing some playoff games. But I don't remember being out there for. I know I it was played for you three, wanted the extra time, or you just didn't. I, I just they didn't even they didn't the they just didn't have us go out. It was just the way it was. It became uh, league wide, I believe, in two thousand nine. Right. I think it was up to each. And I think right. league, uh, up to the each deal team. with the Department of Defense, if I'm not right. mistaken. So go ahead. But I just. But when I when I was out there, man, it was a it was a time like Chris said, it was a time to honor our country and to be thankful for the opportunity. And the opportunity is this: not that I wasn't scared, but the opportunity was I got to live out my childhood dream. Just since the time I was twelve, the only thing I ever wanted to be was a football player, and that comes with sacrifice. And so you're thankful for that. And, and as Chris said, you know, your prayers and, and praying for safety. And um, I'm 100% with you on all that stuff because you understand. I mean, there was never a game that I went into that I felt good. I used to pray before no. I went in my locker room. No. Uh, before I left the locker room, I would be in my locker. And I used to have this imaginary jar that I would pray, just hold my pain. Just let me play efficiently for the seven seconds that I have to play. I'll accept it in the huddle, and I'll accept it after the play. But just let me be there for my teammates for these seven seconds for 65 plays that I can play well for those guys. And then I'll gladly accept it when I come back in the locker room, and I'll gladly accept it for the rest of the week. But just give me the opportunity to go out there and perform for these guys. Because ultimately, for me is every guy that I ever played with, every guy that worked at the organization that I, mm. that I worked for, was more important than me. And that's how I've tried to live my life. And so that's, that's when I stood there, I thought about all the other people that have sacrificed so that I could play this game. And that's what it, what it was for me.
Mark, did you think about, and we asked CC this yesterday, did you think about how you would handle the situation? I mean, it's, a, I'm sure, something a lot of former players sure. are dealing with now. What you would do if it, listen, you were still I, playing listen, today? You know, I hear so many people talk about, um, it, you know, it's an affront to the anthem. It's, uh, you know, disrespectful to the flag. You know what's disrespectful to the flag is that we live in a society where we don't love each other. That's disrespectful. We live in a society where we have never been more connected from a technology standpoint and less connected as people. I walked through the streets of New York yesterday and I almost got run over 15 times because people are doing this while they're walking through the streets. There's no contact. We, I was sorry and I feel like you right. keep bringing no, it up. No, no. I apologize like four times. But so. it, like we, we're not connected. That's an affront mm-hmm. to this country. Right. You know, I, I heard Greg Popovich say this and it broke my heart. You know, my dad never told me, hey, if you get pulled over by police, yeah. you know, if you get pulled over by police, this is how you act. You know that as a white guy, I've never told my kids, I've never even thought about it, never crossed my mind. Greg Popovich said this, and I've talked to several people since. He said, every black friend that I have has told their kids how to act and how to behave if the police pull you over or the police, you know, confront you. That's a sad, that's a sad statement on where we are as a country. And for me... It's, it's about recognizing that there are inequalities in this country. And it's not about disrespecting the flag. It's about saying, hey, this is not right. And what are we going to do about this? And for the people who say, well, listen, you know, um, it's not the right place at the right time. Well, what is the right place at the right time? Where you there can't you see it so it doesn't make, so it doesn't make an impact yeah. on you? It, what would have happened? Uh, what would have happened if Rosa Parks gave up her seat and then just wrote a strongly worded letter to the bus company? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Nothing would have happened. Unless we're uncomfortable about it, unless we're honest about it, unless we look at it from through that prism, and and unless we have compassion and kindness and love in our hearts, then nothing is going to change. And so for me, I would support every one of my teammates. I don't know that I would kneel. Right. But I, I would support my teammates because I do recognize I do recognize some of the inequities that go on in this country. I see it. And that was some of the conversation, Mark, that I was having with younger players before Sunday's game. And they're like, you know, what do I do? I said, I can't tell you what to do, but I'm going to tell you what you are. Support your teammates. Right. And how you do that, that, that's totally up to you. But you need to support your teammates. This is a team sport, and you should be united as a team. Mm-hmm. And Mike Tomlin's right. Man, we're football players. We haven't been involved in politics. Really don't, a bunch of them don't have strong views. And a lot of these guys are scared for their job. They work in check to check, week to week. Why should I express myself on something that people are getting grief about? Famous people, Steph Curry, LeBron. And I'm sitting here trying to stay on the football team. Right. And take care of my spouse or my kid or like, no, why do I? Why? So a lot of people are forced into what's happening in the protest. And they all saw what happened to Colin Kaepernick. I mean, he stood up for himself and now he doesn't have a job. And if you want to connect the two, you can. According to reports, Dwayne Wade will sign with the Cleveland Cavaliers later today. This move will reunite him with LeBron James, his teammate for four years in Miami, where together they won two titles. Nick, are the Cavs better with Wade this year than they were last year? They are certainly deeper. And the depth is what killed them in the finals. This, the People see that the finals went 4-1 Golden State, and they think, oh, well, the Cavs had no shot. They ignore the fact that the Cavs were one Kyle Korver three in the corner, away from that thing being 2-2, two, two, mm-hmm. best of three. And they ignore this fact. In the finals, that the Cavs lost four games to one. With LeBron James on the court, Cavs were beat per 100 possessions, 118 to 117, meaning about as close as you can get. When LeBron James rested during the finals, they were beat 112 to 75, outscored by 37 points per 100 possessions when LeBron James on the bench. Now you have Dwayne Wade, who can play with and without LeBron. Wade's not still a great player, but he's still a useful player. You add Isaiah Thomas. You add Jay Crowder. And people are going to say, yeah, but you lose Kyrie Irving. Let me just remind America that last season, 
when LeBron wasn't on the court, which is what we're talking about, but Kyrie Irving was, the Cavs were awful. They were outscored by eight points per 100 possessions when Kyrie was out there, but LeBron was not. That team fell apart without LeBron. If Dwayne Wade helped stem that, then of course it makes him better. LeBron, he always likes familiar faces. One of his favorite teammates of all time, besides Dwayne Wade, James Jones, the champ. That's what he calls him, right? Yep, champ. champ. And he likes traveling around. He likes working out. He likes interacting with some of these guys. There's no one in the NBA that's logged more minutes with LeBron than D. Wade. Now, my only problem with D. Wade going there is I know Cleveland can only play him 55 to 60 games. That, and that might be a little much. Now, because he is not Bad, an 80 what, 20, game. 20, 25 minutes a game. Yes, yes, but is he an upgrade, the combination of him and J.R. Smith at the two, another ball handler, J.R. struggles handling the ball, and is only effective beyond the three. So D. Wade can be used in the pick and roll. He can also relieve LeBron as far as some of the ball handling. And let's not forget Derrick Rose. So not only did they get better, but their second unit, got a lot better is this it for the Cavs do they need are they a move or two moves away or if this is the team that that starts the season you're happy with this team taking you all the way if you have the best player in a series you always have a good chance to win that series the Cavs will have the best without this move they would have the best player in any series they played so they they were a championship contender before this move this move helps them if they end up flipping that Brooklyn pick for a legitimate player as I laid out yesterday how they could add Boogie Cousins without that if people want to see it, they could add, if you trade mm-hmm. Iman Shumpert, Tristan Thompson, I'm sorry, Iman Shumpert, Channing Fry, and that Nets pick, that works to get Boogie Cousins. Then all of a sudden, that you, we can show you what that lineup looks like now that D. Wade is officially a part of it, and you see a starting five of Isaiah Thomas, Dwayne Wade, LeBron James, Kevin Love, DeMarcus Cousins, and then a bench, Ooh. gosh, Rose, J.R., Crowder, Kyle Korver, I know you're higher on Jeff Green than I am. But then the team goes from, like, the contender in the East to the favorite, no matter what Golden State does. Like, I, the the Cavs were closer last year than people give them credit for. And adding, people are going to compare D. Wade, CC, to D. Wade in 2010. You don't have to be that guy. No. He's making the league minimum. He's got to be better than what they had. And is he better than what they had? Yes. And also, D. Wade is the kind of guy that before halftime, because the NBA is about, how you kind of end the quarters, D-Wade can get you. In the last five minutes, second quarter, he can get you 12 points. When LeBron is on the bench, he can be the goal. He can run the offense through him. In the fourth quarter, can he get you a bucket? Can you run an isolation? Can you run a play to him? Yes. And his overall championship experience calms the nerves inside the locker room. So there's a benefit to sign in that veteran experience. Especially if there is a chance that Isaiah Thomas isn't available until January. Right, yes. You mm-hmm. got a guy in there that comes right in. Well, yeah. the, and that, the, the Cavs as a whole are, obviously, it's not like the West where the home court really could matter because there are so many really good teams. Right. I don't believe the Celtics are a true contender. I just told the audience what Kyrie, when he's the best player on a court, what his team does. That wasn't the case for Isaiah Thomas last year. When he was out there, the Celtics, as the best player, Celtics were out outscoring people, and that was going up against teams' best units. So you you just need the Cavs to be operating at full capacity by end of February, beginning of March. That's what we're talking about here. Right. And those expectations really help out a older team. You're talking about guys who Richard Jefferson thought about retiring. D. Wade is up there. Fry. He's up there. Like all these guys, when you have that, and they showed that last year with Boston. Boston was the number one seed, took it away immediately. And I I agree with you on that point, but I believe D. Wade, man, his ability to be a playmaker off the dribble instead of J.R. Smith or the combination of both of them is is an upgrade. Instead of Darren Williams. Assistant coaches from USC, Arizona, Auburn, and Oklahoma State are among 10 people facing charges as a result of an FBI probe into college basketball corruption. The University of Louisville has also confirmed that it is included in the investigation, which accuses coaches of taking bribes to steer players towards agents, advisors, and sportswear companies. 
CC, you've been through the NCAA system. How surprised were you by all of this, top to bottom? There's just there's a lot to consume here. Well, first of all, not surprised at all. Um, this has been going on in basketball for over 30 years. What has been going on? Um, as far as payment through shoe companies to handlers, family, typically with a recruited athlete. Um, there's one decision maker or one point of contact. And in recruiting, those who are good at it, they know that they must secure that relationship. And that will help secure the kid coming to your university. So from a, an apparel standpoint, especially with AAU, what the shoe companies have done is they try to get the kids in the shoes and in gear by that company as soon as possible. So you're talking about kids as young as 10 years old to 14 being sponsored by shoe companies. It's been happening for a long, long time. Then when Michael Jordan got signed, things began to change. There became a lot of individual money in the shoe game. So Adidas tried to get into the shoe game with Nike. Nike was dominant at that point. Um, Adidas signed some prominent high school players. Um, Tracy McGrady, they signed. I think they went after Kobe earlier. Um, signed. They had Kobe. Yes. They had Kobe. And so it started to trickle down to, wow, these one and dones. So not only did the shoe company start getting more specific, but they really started targeting the one and done players. The ones either going to play one year or they're going straight from high school, which Kobe was able to do. So they've been trying to get money to the handlers. So if I can get this kid signed a shoe contract, forget about the one year or zero years he's going to play in college. They're also negotiating a fee on on the length of their pro career. So we see these shoe contracts now, $100, $200 million. These handlers and financial advisors are giving money to parents and people who are around this athlete so they can secure their rights. So there's a lot of bunches, a lot of crazy stuff going on. And it's been going on for a long time. This is just the beginning. Um, I was part of an FBI investigation in college at Ohio State. And when the feds call you, they have the answers to the questions. And yesterday, what was really intriguing was in their press conference, they warned college basketball players, call us. Coaches, I think. Coaches, yes. Call us before we call you because the, we have your game plan. So this quote, is just the beginning. To the, the, the quote that was in what was released yesterday. What, released he, what we've released here, quote, does not include all of the facts I have learned during the course of this investigation. And that's when they then said, and here's the phone number. So they, they are letting you know we got a lot more than this. Yes. This is just so if you want to tell on yourself and if you think you might be caught up in this, we could take it easier on you. I, my, my reaction is a little different than yours, Chris. Wait, before you give your reaction, mm -hmm. just, just break down simply for people that are just sort of figuring out what's happening here. The crux of the investigation is what? The crux of the investigation is that shoe companies, along with the universities, are, are shoe companies are paying players to go. The different universities, there's Nike schools, there's Adidas schools, yes. there's yes. Under Armour schools. That, yes. right. And so you want a player. I, I, listen, my son's not going to be a professional basketball player, but my son plays college basketball. He played on the AAU circuit. His team was sponsored by Adidas. So all the kids got free Adidas gear. That's legal, by the way. Yes. The hope is that the kid, one of the kids... Uh, uh, one out know, of a hundred. Right. One, that one of these kids is going to be a pro. He's going to be like, man, I wore Adidas in high school. Yep. I went to an Adidas school. I might as well sign with Adidas. The shoe companies are just casting a bunch of, a bunch of, what do you call it when you're fishing? I, reels? I don't know. I apologize. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> casting a bunch of lines saying it's worth, it's worth a hundred grand here, 10 grand here, five grand here. If one of these guys is James Harden. If right. one of these yes. guys ends up becoming, okay, so, so, so that's is, the idea. Okay. So for me, and Chris is going to kill me on this. I think this was a great day for college sports. Because at some point, this got to get torn down. The way we do things here has to be torn down. And it's not going to be torn down through Yahoo Sports investigations. It's not going to be torn down through ham-handed NCAA probation. We're mm -hmm. vacating this title. It's going to be torn down when people realize there are tens to hundreds of millions of dollars floating out there that people are grabbing except for the young kids 
by the way, mostly poor, overwhelmingly black, who get paid in an education a lot of them can't take advantage of, room and board. And not only can the schools not pay them, Adidas can't pay them. Nike can't pay them. They, so the more this gets pulled away, and we realize well, this is ridiculous, the highest paid employee in 48 states is either the football or basketball coach at the big state school, the highest paid state employee. It is ridiculous that we've got this much money going around and the, and the people that are producing the value aren't getting a piece of it. So, yeah, it's going to be messy for a while. But the situation, the status quo is untenable, CC, and I think this okay, leads to breaking it down. It, it, it can't sustain, your favorite word. It's not sustainable is maybe a better way to put it. Right. I think your conversation is a different conversation about the NCAA, but we're talking about the basketball, what's going on with these basketball coaches, football and the other sports. I believe you're going to have a problem with, with what you would like to do because Title IX – in equal dollars. But just keep it to the shoe companies. Uh, right now, the shoe companies can't pay the players, kids directly. Right. It's a, that's another conversation. All right? This is a huge mess in basketball. We're going to see programs torn down. We're going to see coaches fired. And this is just the beginning of it. And anytime you have a legendary coach like Rick Patino involved. It's going to cost him his job. Okay? Yes. It, it, and, and it should cost him his job. Three scandals for him. I mean, but even if this was his first one, if they paid the kid a hundred grand this summer to play for Louisville, the kid came there on an unofficial visit. That's a sweet jacket, though. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be tough for him to get beyond. And we can't assume that this is the first time this has happened. <laughs> we can't assume oh, that no, this no, is no, the no. most money that has passed from hand to hand. We can't assume Man, that this I is the Blue only Chips. program that they this has happened to. was getting them John Deere's. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to tell you, if your school happens to be an Adidas school, watch your coaches. Because all coaches last night in Division One were having staff meetings, and the head coach was saying, guys, please let me know. Is there something that I need to know? And because this, the feds are coming. This is going to happen soon, no? It's going to be a long process, but it's going to drag down a bunch of people. Thank you for listening to the First Things First podcast. Remember, leave us a review and tell us what you think. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts and catch us on FS1 Monday through Friday, 6.30 a.m. Eastern on FS1. For Chris Carter and Nick Wright, I'm Jenna Wolf. So long, everybody.